light. We all see it and its effects. Reflection, refraction, just to name a couple, but what actually is it? Now today we've got some good answers, but back in the 17th century, not many scientists had any idea. But two scientists of the time had some ideas. However, they were in complete opposition. So today, we're going to look at their two models and how they explain various light behaviours and see who won out in the end. So stay tuned. Now there were two great scientists in that time. Christian Huygens from Holland and Isaac Newton from England, who lived roughly around the same time in the 17th century, right at the midst of what we now call the Scientific Revolution. And in the latter half of that century, a key experiment took place that established that light wasn't some instantaneous substance, but that light travelled at a finite speed, so to speak. And that was the experiment by Erle Römer in 1679 as he studied the eclipses of one of the moons of Jupiter. Now I did a video on that that discusses that and I'll pop a description just above. But the question was, what was light actually made up of? Now Christian Huygens argued that light was a form of a wave. Isaac Newton, however, believed that light was actually made up of particles, which he called corpuscles. Now both used their models to explain various behaviours of light, such as reflection and refraction and polarisation. And what I plan to do is use their models to explain these behaviours. Now I want to stress though that what I'm presenting is not the real explanation of the behaviour of light, but how these men believe it to be. So let's start with Newton. Now Newton believed that these corpuscles of light were tiny, perfectly elastic particles travelling at very high speeds. They behave with the laws of physics like any masses such as balls and planets, but since they were so tiny, when two light beams intersected they did not scatter with each other. So let's have a look how he explained various phenomena. So let's talk about Newton's understanding of reflection using his corpuscular method. I'm going to assume you understand the law of reflection, that is the incident angle equals the reflected angle. Now here's our particle, it's coming in and it's bouncing off the surface and of course it's coming off uh, the other side. Now let's have a look at the path. So here's our path and Newton said, well hold on, it's moving in two directions. It's moving horizontally but it's also moving vertically. So horizontally he's saying, well that's going to be exactly the same velocity. It's not going to change velocities in terms of the horizontal motion. But because it's an elastic collision, as far as Newton understood it, he said, well, the velocity vertically is the same as the velocity vertically on the other side, obviously in the opposite direction. And so when you resolve those two vectors, you're going to see that the actual angle coming in is the same as the angle out. And so there is Newton's understanding of reflection. Let's now look at refraction. So here is our particle and it is also moving and in this case our particle is not bouncing off the surface, it is now entering into the surface. And again, in this case, Newton knows that it bends towards the normal and I assume you understand the nature of refraction, at least in that terminology. And so he said, again, horizontally we have motion in that direction and we still have that velocity also in that direction once we go into the surface. But why does it bend? Well, it's a particle. And so this particle interacts with the matter. And so as a result, there's these attractive forces. Now, whilst it's inside the matter, those forces cancel out. So therefore the path remains straight, same outside as well. But the issue is what happens at the interface. And so Newton argued, said, well, hold on, what's going to happen here is that there's a force of attraction. And so what that means is that it's going to be pulled in. And so as a result, if the velocity of the situation here is that value here, he's saying, look, the matter interacts with it and pulls it in stronger. And as a result, it's going to have a velocity that is bigger. And so when you resolve those two vectors, you're going to get an angle here like so, and an angle here like so. And here's the critical point. The way that Newton saw it is that the velocity increases as it passes through the substance. And you can see that by just looking at the mathematics of these vectors is that the vector is now larger. And so that's a critical point here with 
Newton's corpuscular theory is that he assumed that the velocity of the corpuscles is actually greater in the denser substance. And because of the fact that denser substances have more particles, they're going to go traveling faster and therefore you have different refractive indexes, which is about the relationship of the velocities with the outside and the inside. But I want you to note though, we often see reflection and refraction happening. For example, if you look at a glass, you see reflection, but you also see through it, so you also have refraction. And unfortunately, Newton's corpuscular theory doesn't allow for an explanation for that. So now let's have a look at his famous experiment to do with prisms. And many of you may have be recognized something similar into this image of what Newton did. And so we had light passing through a prism, and of course it dispersed, and we produced a rainbow. Now, how did he explain this? So let's have a closer look. And so here's our white light, and here we look at just the path of the red corpuscle. Well, if it's a red corpuscle, we need a corpuscle in place. And so what Newton argued is like, this corpuscle is reasonably large, and so therefore the material interacts with it, bends it, as we discussed it before in refraction, and only bends it a certain amount because of the size of the corpuscle. But what about the other colors? Well, they also made up of corpuscles, but they progressively get smaller as we move up the spectrum. And so therefore, the smaller the particle, the smaller the corpuscle, the more affect the interaction of the material, the glass, and so it bends more. And so he was able to show that white light isn't a single entity. It's actually made up of different colors. Why? Because different colors have different sizes of corpuscles. And so by using a prism, he was able to spread them out and therefore show the colors of the rainbow. Now here I've got five representative examples of our colors of the rainbow. And you say, well, aren't there supposed to be seven? Well, really the number seven was actually put in place by Newton. Why seven? Well, actually he thought seven was a nice number to spread the colors of the rainbow out into because in the Greek mythology, seven was a mystical number. And so that's why we have seven colors of the rainbow. It has nothing to do with the fact that there is only seven colors in the rainbow. There's actually an almost infinite number of colors of in the rainbow. Now, unfortunately, he failed to come up with an adequate explanation for a key phenomena, and that was diffraction. You see, when light passes through a small hole, it spreads out. And if light was made of particles, why would it do that? And then there was the observation by Erasmus Bartholin, who observed a double refraction of light through calcite crystals. Now, two images appeared, and they moved as you turned the crystal. Maybe the light was split into two types. Now Newton's best response to, was on this idea was that, that the corpuscles had some sort of sides, but really that wasn't satisfactory. So now let's have a look at Huygen. Huygen believed that light source emanated in the form of wavefronts and that they were spherical and that each wavefront would generate the next wavefront and so forth. Now let me explain this. So here I have a wave and I want you to imagine here is a wavefront or a set of a ring of waves after you've dropped a stone in the pond. And this is the way that Huygen tried to imagine why there were successive wavefronts. So this wavefront here will produce a particular wavelet in a particular direction. Now it's actually spherical, but we've got a two dimensional aspect here. Now we know of course that sphere goes backwards and sideways and at least as far as uh, Huygen, he really didn't explain why we're only having this one here in this direction, but we're gonna use that as our example. Now obviously that's not the only point. There are lots of points all around that that also produce these wavelets. Now I've only got a certain number here, but there are actually many, many more. But what happens is that all of those add up to produce our next wavefront. And then of course you get your successive wavefronts after that, each being produced by the one that was previous. If we then look at the direction of the wavefronts, you'll see that the path, the ray, so to speak, is perpendicular to the wavefronts at all junctions. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Christian Huygens' understanding of wavefronts to see how he explained reflection and refraction. But in this case, we're gonna use an animation to help us understand that. And I use this animation from Walter Fent, and I'm gonna put a link in the description below if you want to have, look more at some of his great animations. So here you can see the wavefront coming in, and of course it's moving from the left side of the screen. Now watch what happens when it hits the surface. You can see little wavelets being formed, and as a result, it produces a wavefront that is moving off at exactly the same angle than the wavefront that arrived. 
So here's our wavefront coming in, and in this case, you'll see that our wavefront, in this case, produces these little wavelets that are now passing through the material. But because the wavelets are now moving slower, you'll see that the wavefront that's produced when they add up is actually moving at a different angle towards the normal, and you can see uh, that now. And now what you're gonna see is both reflection and refraction occurring at the same time. And you'll see that Huygens' model adequately explains why that occurs. We have the wavelets forming at the boundary that are reflecting and also wavelets bound happening at the boundary that are refracting and you see both take place. The key thing here is, is that Huygens' model also was able to explain diffraction. Let me explain. So as you can see from this great animation from FET, you see the wavefronts hitting the barrier, but there's a small opening. But because the wavefronts are made up of successive little wavelets, the one wavelet that meets the opening continues. And so therefore you get these concentric circles on the other side of the wall. You see diffraction and the waves are bending around the wall. And what about the double refraction? Now Huygen didn't really have an answer, but it was later as polarization was further studied in the 19th century and a wave model best describes the behavior of polarization. So in essence, Huygen saw light is a form of a longitudinal wave traveling through space. Now, what would the medium be? Well, he believed there existed this unseen medium called the ether, which allowed light to travel through space. So let's summarize. So in terms of reflection, in terms of their models, we can argue that Newton did a pretty good job, but so did Huygen. In terms of refraction, yes, Newton did a reasonably good job of understanding why it bends, as did Huygens. Well, what about diffraction? Well, diffraction is problematic in terms of Newton, so no, that doesn't work there, but Huygens' understanding definitely works. Polarization, which is the um, doubled refraction that was observed, neither could really provide a good explanation as to why they occurred. And then we got interference. Now, in terms of interference, that wasn't really studied properly until the 19th century. Newton's understanding doesn't help us understand it at all, whereas Huygens understanding of waves does. So how did the scientific community respond? Well, Newton's corpuscular theory was the one that held sway in the scientific community. And there are really two reasons for this. Now first, Newton was a huge man of scientific stature. His Principia, which discussed the laws of motion and the calculus that supported it, was hugely popular and accepted. Now who was one to argue with him on his views of light? Now, Newton did have his critics of the corpuscular model, and one of his most vocal critics was Francis Bacon, who supported the wave model. And it's possibly the reason why Newton delayed publishing his book Optics until Bacon died. Now secondly, Huygen was less than known, and he also only provided a geometric explanation for light, and not a mathematical one, and that was what's needed if it was to be accepted by the scientific community, and that really didn't come until the work of Fresnel in the early 1800s. And so the corpuscular theory stood for some time, until that is, two key experiments in the 1800s. Now the first was in 1801 by Thomas Young with his double slit experiment. Again, I have a video already on that and I encourage you to look at the link above. But the key finding here is that he was able to demonstrate interference using the wave model of light. However, there was still some resistance in the scientific community to reject the corpuscular theory. And then in 1850, Foucault, in a modified setup of his apparatus to measure the speed of light, determined that light traveled slower in water than in air. Now this was in direct opposition to Newton's model where he expected the light to speed up, but only waves would slow down in water, and thus that spelt the end of the corpuscular theory. It's funny how a single experiment can destroy a whole well-constructed model, but science works that way. Light was a wave after all. Now both models actually are flawed, and they've been replaced with Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. Yes, light is a wave, but it's a transverse one composed of oscillating electric and magnetic fields, and I encourage you to check out my video on Maxwell. So is that how the story ends? Well, no. In 1905, Einstein published his work on the photoelectric effect, which demonstrated that light traveled in discrete packets, which he called quanta, or photons as we now call them. So light travels as a wave and a particle. Now we refer to this as the wave-particle duality of light, so in a roundabout way, Newton and Huygens were both right after all. I hope that's given you a better understanding of the history behind 
an understanding of the nature of light. Check out my other videos on Maxwell's theory as well as the history behind determining the speed of light. Please like, share and subscribe. Drop a comment down below if this video has been particularly helpful. My name is Paul from High School Physics Explained. Take care. Bye for now.